Thanks for tuning in to another installment of Advanced TV Herstory, a podcast that analyzes shows and celebrates women of television. Thousands of comedies, variety shows, and dramas have aired, yet the presence of strong women, both in front of and behind the camera, is often a story untold. Well, Advanced TV Herstory begs to differ. There's so much more, and it's worth telling and retelling. Sometimes shows offer great leadership lessons or are so timeless in their writing that people say the series has aged well. We'll explore those shows further. We'll revisit moments in TV where women broke records, exceeded expectations, or put their careers on the line. Advanced TV history will connect the treasures of the past to the great potential of today's TV and online platforms and how it all plays a part in being a woman in America today. Tomorrow's success is rooted in understanding what has come before us. So gear up for a little storytelling and fun, sociology, fashion, economics, or strategy. It's all here in Advanced TV Herstory. I'm your host, Cynthia Bemis Abrams. Recently, Advanced TV Herstory's email inbox received a message of joy, actually a message from joy, from Ottawa, who shares our enthusiasm for women and television. She wrote, I found your podcast by fluke when searching for material on the late Patty Duke. I'm really enjoying other episodes, particularly the Mary Tyler Moore ones. So, Joy shared a terrific list of ideas for future installments, including the women of ER, specifically Carrie Weaver, Susan Lewis, and Abby Lockhart. Joy, let me tell you, this one and the next one, and maybe even one more, These segments are for you, and I promise to work on the other story ideas you presented as well. Thanks for your enthusiasm and your salutation of keep on podcasting. You know it, Joy, I will. Okay, on to ER. In 1994, a medical drama appeared on the horizon that would change TV storytelling. This was no Marcus Welby or Sleepy Medical Center, although Medical Center did have Chad Everett. ER's first three episodes demonstrated consistent innovation in blending the personal lives of medical professionals with the workplace challenges that had come to be in the 1990s. And all of this was done in exhaustive detail. The three first episodes lay the foundation for 15 seasons of remarkable, acclaimed TV. This installment of Advanced TV History scrolls all the way back in ER's exhaustive archives to the first two seasons, because when it all began, viewers followed the realistic story arcs of two strong women characters, Dr. Susan Lewis, played by Sherry Stringfield, and Nurse Carol Hathaway, played by Juliana Margulies. Amid a growing cast, these two held their own to deliver memorable performances, and they gave us insight into the lives of women in the medical profession in the mid-1990s. In Dr. Lewis, we'll get to see the work-life balance question plunked squarely, albeit unexpectedly, into the lap of this smart, articulate, and mostly brave doctor. With the benefit of 20 years' herstory, we'll grab some audio that shows just how hard she worked and how her competitive peers treated her back in the day. Nurse Hathaway's story was both reflective and aspirational. She dated men of all stripes and character, but none met her expectations. Those expectations of what she wanted in life and what she she felt she could contribute, all of that had an effect on her career path. And so we sort of see her personal life, we see her career path coming out of that of being a nurse. Excellent and well-written storytelling, that was the hallmark of ER. So let's review a bit about what else went into ER that made it different. Clearly, there was influence of two veteran writers and producers who just happened to be women. Lydia Woodward and Carol Flint had teamed up in prior series, most notably China Beach and St. Elsewhere. Woodward would go on to become ER's showrunner. Woodward and Flint would also be joined, even early in the, in the series run, by directors Leslie Linka Gladder, who is the genius or one of the geniuses behind the series Homeland, and Mimi Later. I have to believe that the strength of these women and their confident presence 
behind the scenes contributed to noticeable elements like paramedic crews that consistently featured a woman, usually providing the patient details as they brought said patient in on the gurney. An actress like Emily Wagner, who played medic Doris Pickman in 160 episodes, here's how she earned her paycheck. Stable BP 100 over 70, pulse 110, rest 18 on our arrival to comatose GCS 5. I'm out of here. Carpe diem. See you, Doris. So every once in a while on ER, it was a team of women, physicians, nurses, and technicians, all working together in a trauma room. That was a powerful image, and there wasn't much sugarcoating of the women in any of these professions. In a realistic fashion, women characters provided constructive feedback, they gave orders, they led teams, and all of this reminded us, and and really when you look back on it now 20 years ago, um, it's just the reminder that medicine is a profession where competence is paramount. And it should be noted that with nearly 5,000 cast members appearing over the 15 seasons, diversity was a high priority. That's, That's very clear from episode one on. Casting was colorblind wherever possible, and they did a terrific job. ER delivered a new approach to medical drama storytelling, putting the viewer squarely in the middle of the action with mobile camera units that traveled alongside carts, viewed patients from overhead, or peered through windows at worried family members. With incredibly rapid dialogue and fast-paced scripts, each episode covered a lot of ground. Some would say that there's an adrenaline factor to hospital jobs, and ER did a tremendous job in depicting that force as it pumped for both genders. On to our two early season characters and these incredible women Um, I hope it brings back some memories if you were a fan of the show back then, or perhaps it will encourage you to check an episode out from the library or grab a DVD. In the early 1990s, Sherry Stringfield's career was on the upswing. Fresh out of college, she landed on the CBS soap opera The Guiding Light. She was an original cast member of NYPD Blue, but she left the show early in its run. Her time on ER was relatively brief, as she left in the third season to, as she says, slow down her life. She returned to her Dr. Susan Lewis character in later seasons and in all appeared in 142 episodes. Now, ER closed its doors in 2009, and that last season was celebrated, and and it was, um, they brought a lot of closure to many characters. Stringfield spoke at a 2007 National Organization for Women, a NOW conference, and the timeless topic of women roles in TV and film came up, and here's how she shared with the audience how she navigated her career in pursuit of quality opportunities. Being a feminist, and now, maybe a feminist, very good, in my mind, it organized, it organized my career very quickly and how I wanted to live my life, and how I wanted to go forth in my business and in my career. I knew that I couldn't work for, for people I couldn't stomach. I knew that I was going to, you know, I knew I was going to take roles for certain reasons, and I knew I was going to turn down roles, and that I had to turn down roles even if I was broke, which is a lot in the you know, being an actor, <laughs> you're broke, you're working. But I knew, like, it just—it was just this very clear, I don't know, bar, whatever that I had set for myself. And so that has always been very, very meaningful to me. Because people say, God, you know, you're so selective. You turn on so much work, or this or that, or how do you choose roles? And it always makes me laugh because I'm like, you know, I, I want to play real women. I want to express myself from what I believe in. And... Certain projects don't always reflect that. Anyway, it's made it interesting and fun, but it's also it's also been somewhat difficult, as you can imagine, being in a male-dominated business where your counterparts, exactly even less trained or whatever, are making ten times the amount you're making or will ever make, maybe. And it's been it has been hard to stand my ground in a business where people are and legitimately so pointing their fingers at. And a business that enjoys putting out, you know, a really good male-dominated violent movie every month or so, you know, you know you're, you're not exactly being heard. 
In season one, we see Dr. Susan Lewis as capable, though in many scenes she's not as active as Dr. Mark Green. Now, the fact that Dr. Mark Green, played by Anthony Edwards, is the attending resident may have something to do with that, but there are many scenes where she was passive or not active uh, as much as she could have been in the scene. And then there were scenes where a male physician is actively tending the patient, and she's looking over his shoulder or at his side. And sometimes she recommended a different course of action than what he was embarking on, and sometimes she tells him, particularly Dr. Green, that she's mi- that he had missed something. And it it seems a little, I don't know, it seems a little passive to me. You get the sense that she was competent and that she was still sort of finding her way in a field dominated by men, but but having presumably gone through a lot of medical school at that point, um, it just feels like she maybe should have been further along. By the mid-1990s, there was an emerging understanding that Western-style medicine wasn't necessarily the most effective way to treat conditions, and Dr. Lewis held that interest in many storylines, for she was either advocating for less invasive approaches or more humane treatments, or at the minimum, extending the observation period a bit longer in order to not proceed unnecessarily or in haste. There are two examples from these early seasons that are worth hearing. First, a heart attack patient who presented in the emergency room with a host of symptoms that would have indicated an impending heart attack. Dr. Lewis treated initially with a round of drug therapy and had called for a cardiologist or the cardiologist on call to see him in the ER. Time passed and ultimately the cardiologist arrived and then set forth to yell at her in front of others that she hadn't taken proper action. So Dr. Morgenstern, who was the chief resident at the time, brought the question of her actions to a teaching session. So you elected not to cardiovert? He seems stable. Hypotensive with chest pain? The pain was controlled. Somewhat. Let's continue, please. Could be a wide complex tachycardia. Was that a consideration? I felt it was rate related. Which it wasn't. No, heart rate dropped. EKG shows an acute inferior wall MI. Why the delay on the intubation? You had the bad gases. I was hoping he'd come around with bagging. When I got the gases back, I tubed him. So you recommended drug therapy, TPA? I do angioplasty with my MIs. Jumping in with TPA messed everything up. He had no contraindications, you weren't available, and time is heart muscle. I was on my way. I didn't know that. People, please, it's just a teaching session. What was the outcome? Did the angio cath, and it was a mess. Bled like a stuck pig. Before I got to the angioplasty, his heart rhythm went haywire. Shocked him once, and he came around. EKG came back to normal, the artery opened. So you never did angioplasty? <laughs> well, I could and hardly. TPA worked? Yes. Dr. Benton, what would you have done? Angioplasty. Dr. Langworthy? Angioplasty. Dr. Green? Angioplasty. Just because we're friends doesn't mean we're always going to agree. That's not the point. The point is I'm getting dragged over the course. You stroll in late. Don't say a word. Well, I missed the first half. How was I supposed to comment? I didn't stop you from commenting in the end. Why do I feel like a traitor? You know, it wasn't personal. I'm dying out there, and you're siding with the slicers and dicers. Benton, Langworthy, they're all surgeons. All they ever want to do is cut people open. That may be a little bit of an exaggeration. The patient was fine with a dose of TPA versus a $10,000... Medicine, law, engineering, software development, this setting could have been in any field. A smart woman saw the value in a different approach and defended it. She had just enough support to take the stage to make her case in a way that demonstrated the value of her decisions. And in this case, Dr. Susan Lewis deserved credit for a favorable outcome. But she didn't get it. We all see the touch of writers Lydia Woodward and Carol Flint when it comes to the compassionate stories that are part and parcel with emergency room work. So we go from Dr. Lewis the woman, the rare woman uh, doctor, to uh, Dr. Lewis, the one doctor who can bring compassion to a situation. 
So here there will be a clip that follows, and Dr. Susan Lewis and Nurse Carol Hathaway, in a very early episode, had been managing the symptoms of an older woman who has end-stage leukemia. And this woman has chosen not to aggressively treat it. She's just choosing to live out her days. They encourage her to at least get a blood transfusion so that she can live out her days more, more productively and comfortably. And so as this woman is leaving their care, she reveals the identity of an Alzheimer's Jane Doe who had been in the unit all day singing and hadn't been able to share with anybody what her name was. So in this episode, Rosemary Clooney is a big name cameo, which also became a hallmark of the show is they had all sorts of famous people pop up. And Rosemary Clooney happens to be the aunt of George Clooney, who plays the notable cad, Dr. Doug Ross. Life begins Mrs. Packer, please reconsider. We can start a transfusion immediately. You'd only have to be here one night. I know that doesn't seem like very long to either of you. To me, it is an eternity. We want to give you more time, not less. You've already given me a wonderful afternoon. It's not every day that I get to hear Mary Cavanaugh sing in person. Mary Cavanaugh? Time flies. My husband and I saw her perform in San Francisco on our honeymoon, 1948. I appreciate your concern. But I have to go. But it becomes increasingly clear that Dr. Lewis doesn't fit in very well with this ER. The situation grows worse when her sister Chloe appears on her doorstep very pregnant and in need of a lot of support. Lewis aided her sister through the delivery of niece Susie, and while the baby was just months old, sister Chloe abandoned her. Stretching over nearly an entire season, Dr. Lewis struggled with unexpected single parenthood. She pondered adoption, questioned her own life plan, and managed her anger and disappointment with her sister at the expense of her career. Oh, I've been notified. This? It's killing me. Oh, I ready. Grandma Vance, a spectacular case earlier, Susan. To shoe in for presentation at the SAEM conference. Might even make it into the annals. Uh-huh. Doctors forget that a seemingly benign anesthetic has the potential for cardiac and neurological toxicity. Okay, let's get this puppy up to the OR. Call up Sheriff Tom, we're en route. I presented at the conference when I was a resident. Terrific case, terrific opportunity. I left the visual aids on the plane. <laughs> well, I should decline your offer, Dr. Morgan Stern, personal reasons. You do realize, don't you, you're a candidate for chief resident next year. I know that I need to start presenting and publishing, but it's just that now it's not a very good time. Yeah, there's never a good time. I just hate to see the personal overwhelm the job. I'm not overwhelmed, Dr. Morgan Stern, and I'm doing my job. Yes, but to build a career, you've got to take on more responsibility. I've taken on plenty of responsibility. So you'll have to forgive me if I don't stay after school these days to work for extra credit. It came to a head when Sister Chloe returned with the baby's father, and they resumed custody of Susie. Heart-wrenching life balance, but it's a story that needs telling every once in a while. Ultimately, Dr. Lewis left the hospital, but returned five seasons later as an attending physician. Now, in this second term, which lasted four seasons, she further developed her voice, but still found herself at odds occasionally with Dr. Carrie Weaver. Her final departure from Cook County General Hospital was prompted by Weaver's decision to award a tenured resident position to Dr. John Carter, not Lewis. Younger than Lewis by a few years, Carter's career was launched in the first season, too. So from season two, when Dr. Weaver is introduced, you get the sense that she doesn't like Dr. Lewis. She's judgmental, but will offer an occasional compliment. Does Weaver sense competition? Is this an alpha woman, there can only be one of us situation? They both seem competent, but at least in the early seasons, Dr. Lewis was the one you'd like to go have a margarita with. Future installments of Advanced TV Herstory will profile other strong women characters of ER. 
With 15 seasons to cover, there were many, and Dr. Carrie Weaver, played by Laura Innes, is one of them. And just as Dr. Susan Lewis opened storylines about less invasive therapies and alternative medicine, Dr. Carrie Weaver represented diversity by having a visible disability, which we learn over time is caused by congenital hip dysplasia. In Season 2, we get a deeper look at this Lewis and Weaver physician relationship. In this clip, Weaver shows compassion and underscores the value of listening and paying attention to clues in the case of a young girl who was brought in suffering seizures. Honey, just settle back down. You're okay. We're right here with you. She woke up agitated, disoriented, kind of put the side rail. Oh, doesn't seem to like the IVs too much. Can't say as I blame her. Can't say as I do either. Who would have thought we'd ever agree on something? Our lab just came back. That's right. You're okay. Just settle down. Uh Just settle down. Uh We're going to take care of you. We're going to take care of you, honey. We're going to take care of you. You're all right. CBC and lights are normal, but her dilatant level is only five. Subtherapeutic. Epileptic seizure caused by her not taking her medication. All right, Chuni, let's give her dilatant seven mgs per kilogram at 50 mgs a minute IV. Coming up. Okay. That's it. That's it. You're okay. Could have gone into pediatrics. Thank you. Sure, we like Carrie Weaver, but not much. Does she have an edge because her disability has forced her to be more aggressive? Both Lewis and Weaver were smart, hardworking doctors, but there was also this difference of motivation. So in this clip, again, back to this uh, situation with the young girl, Weaver follows up with the epileptic patient, and again, we get to see a little bit of a softer side of Dr. Carrie Weaver, though I wouldn't go so far as to say that it is a stereotypical female doctor side. Doing pretty well. Just coming around. Are you deaf? Judy, let's get these restraints off now and call for a sign language interpreter. You know how to sign? Oh, poorly. You're going to be okay. Yes, you had a seizure, but you're fine, uh, fine now. I want to call your family. What's your name? Hi, Janie. I'm Carrie. Okay. So as a viewer, sometimes it was honestly a relief to have the camera leave the tussle of Weaver and and Lewis and put us in the situation with Nurse Carol Hathaway, who was another talented, hardworking woman, this nurse who was so well-liked in the ER. Now, the importance of the first three episodes is that we see Hathaway as a competent team player. There were hints that she'd had a relationship with Dr. Doug Ross, and Clooney so defined the title of CAD in his entire time as Doug Ross. So in episode two, at the end of the shift, Carol Hathaway leaves work. Only hours later, a medic team brought her in as an overdose patient. The first three episodes together, they build up and they recover from her suicide attempt and the team's reaction. This was all very important. Think about how many TV shows had put across a very realistic overdose attempt and recovery and reintroduced that person back into his or her very stressful workplace. I have to believe that this was really a TV first, or at least a TV first that was achieved with the dramatic storytelling that it did. ER's risk-taking and innovation was revealed in these first three episodes. Great acting great writing. The Carol Hathaway incident and her return opened up chances for dialogue about life, about second chances, protecting yourself from others, and as a woman not settling for something or someone who doesn't meet your expectations. Margulies, the actress, proved her acting chops as Carol. She delivered the drama And there was probably a period of time when we all thought Carol Hathaway would define Margulies as an actress. 
um, Margulies left the show in season six, uh, which was two th- the year 2000. But there again, in 2009, she premiered in the title role of the acclaimed TV drama The Good Wife and has now really established herself as a very, very accomplished actress. In her six seasons, Nurse Carol Hathaway lived a complicated life to the fullest. She showed heart and instincts and excellent nursing skills. In nine, in nine episodes of season two, we see future CSI star Georgia Fox, who would play Sarah Seidel in CSI. She appeared as Dr. Maggie Doyle, an intern. We learn that Doyle is two years younger than Carol Hathaway and that they attended the same high school and community college. And there's a storyline where they are both called upon to treat a patient who turned out to be their high school chemistry teacher. We learn that Hathaway was a student of great potential in his eyes. In fact, the chem teacher mistook her for being a physician. When Doyle appears, well, actually Doyle wants to avoid any duty, any contact with the chem teacher, as she revealed that she failed his class twice. So Carol Hathaway processes this. Um, She's had a hard time finding stability in her personal life, and she begins to wonder if her talents in medicine are actually wasted in nursing and she should pursue something a bit more challenging. Here she and Dr. Doyle are with a patient. You're not pregnant. Can you understand me? Yes, good. Good. But now we have to do a pelvic exam to find out why you're having pain. You do the exam? No, um, a doctor's going to come and do the exam, but he's very good. No, 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 I don't need, I'm fine, not pregnant. Okay. All right, Miss uh, Young-Ku Beck, that seems to be the problem. No problem, I could go home now. Dad, can I talk to you outside for a minute? Sure. You just sit tight, I'll be right back. I'll be right back. This girl's 15 years old, one sexual experience two months ago. Abdominal pain, fever's 101. She complains of vaginal discharge. She's not pregnant. Sounds like PID. I'll give her a pelvic. Well, uh, she's a little jumpy. She's never had a pelvic. I don't think she's seen many doctors. I think I can handle that. I'm afraid she's going to bolt, but she'd probably let me take the cultures. So you're second-guessing me too now, right? No, Doug, I don't give a damn about you. I'm trying to take care of a patient. Whoa, whoa, what's up? Nothing. Carol just thinks she's better suited to perform a pelvic without me. I... Carol, you know that you... I just want to take the swabs. At least diagnose her PID. She's really afraid of men. Doyle, you free? Almost. Mark, that's my patient. Come help Carol do a pelvic. Sure. Okay. Who hasn't been in the position of assisting someone who has chosen a different, different career path, but one that's more rewarding and has a higher status, but that this person really isn't as smart as you are? Those experiences can either be a wake-up call for reflection or lead to bitterness, a whole sort of glass-half-empty, glass-half-full thing. Oh, man, I haven't done one of these in six months. Don't worry, I've assisted a million. Thanks. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, just relax. Good. Now, let your knees fall open. Good. Okay, Uh, this is going to feel a little weird. Okay, Yunku, take a deep breath. Good, good. Dr. Doyle's going to take a deep breath, too. Now angle lower. Right, all right. Relax these muscles. Don't push away. Dr. Doyle isn't going to push either. Nobody's going to push. It's just going to slide right in. There. Now rotate and click. KOH and wet mount. And chlamydia. There you go. Fortunately for Carol Hathaway, Dr. Doyle was more interested in getting along with everybody. She offered tips about the pre-med program at Malcolm X Community College. What's my old alma mater coming to? You went to Malcolm X? My first year. Hey, they got a very prestigious pre-med night school. Oh, wait a minute. Whoa. Wait. See there? Bio 1, organic chemistry, physics, all your basics. 
You got a problem with that? Hey, Jerry. Hey, Dr. Ross, we got a 12-year-old GSW coming. Over the next several seasons, we'd follow Nurse Hathaway as she decided against becoming a doctor and met and parted with a host of men who didn't live up to the bar, that high standard, that Doug Ross actually had set as her soulmate. The later seasons were different from the first two seasons, as Margulies' character's emphasis went from work-based challenges to the more serial soap opera wandering of her personal life. One might say that all the women characters got a shot at depicting the work-life balance in some fashion. The challenge of squeezing into one day that of caring for all these patients, as well as caring for a loved one, or caring for themselves. In its 15 years, the show bagged 23 Emmys amid 124 nominations. Margulies won a Best Supporting Actress Emmy in 1995, that was the series' first season, and numerous Screen Actors Guild and Viewers for Quality Television Awards in subsequent seasons. Yep, 331 episodes. The storylines take viewers beyond the walls of the ER and the apartments of the main characters. Advanced TV history will profile characters who appeared in many episodes, like Carrie Weaver and Abby Lockhart, who was played by Maura Tierney, and Alex Kingston's Dr. Elizabeth Corday. We'll also find those gem moments of long-serving supporting actresses like Yvette Feldman as Nurse Haley Adams and Laura Sharon as Chuni Marquez. And maybe we'll tip our hat to Frances Sternhagen, who played Dr. Carter's mother, Angela Bassett, who capably gave us Dr. Kate Banfield, or Gloria Rubin's Jeannie Boulay, or Sally Field as Dr. Lockhart's mother, And, of course, ER is where Mariska Hargitay was discovered with her acting ability when she was appeared in uh, about a dozen episodes as Cynthia Hooper. There is so much more to the incomparable TV series ER than heartthrobs George Clooney and Noah Wiley. Just ask Advanced TV Herstory. Stable BP 100 over 70, pulse 110, rest 18 on our arrival from comatose GCS5. I'm out of here. Carpe diem. See you, Doris. So there you have it. Thanks for listening to this installment, which was on a long list of topic ideas, but rose quickly to the top as a result of Joy from Ottawa's suggestion. Clips in this installment are from the ER Season 3, Episodes 3 and 4, and Season 2's Episode 6 and 8. The clip of the Now speech that Sherry Stringfield delivered in, in 2007 is found on YouTube. Some of the 331 episodes of ER are found online, um, either through pay sites or on YouTube. All 15 seasons have been produced onto DVD, and I'd call this a good investment because I honestly think that the show has aged very well. Find this script and past segment scripts on my website, CynthiaBemisAbrams.com, or you can be like Joy and send your ideas for future segments or commentary on past ones to advancedtvherstory at gmail.com. Or find one more way to leave comments or rate the podcast by going to iTunes or our hosting site Libsyn, L-I-B-S-Y-N. And lastly, we're on Twitter with the handle of at tvherstory as well as Facebook. Our community only gets larger, so thanks for being a part of it and for all you do when you share advanced TV history with friends. I'm your host, Cynthia Bemis Abrams.